Recording our entire service will be recorded. So on Zoom, if you wish to turn off your video feed, that's okay. People so here, you're going to be recorded. So our musical prelude, the opening words, and indeed the entire service today will be presented in words and in song by today's guest presenters, Pat Lamana, yes, and Lydia Adams Davis. For several decades, these amazing women have created and performed music that has inspired and entertained on CDs, in concerts, and in many Unitarian services. We're fortunate and we're grateful to welcome Pat and Lydia to Rock Tavern today and look forward to a timely, educational, entertaining, and inspiring service. as a remote host. So welcome to everyone here and there. For those in the sanctuary, when you speak in order to be heard uh, on Zoom, please come forward and I'll share my microphone with you. If, um, most of us, I think by now, are familiar with Zoom. So if you're going to speak on Zoom, be sure you unmute yourself, either by clicking on the mic in the lower left corner of your screen or by putting it on your space bar. The chat box is available. Just click the word chat, choose a recipient, write your message, and press enter. 
you may also click on the links to the chat to share your information and receive our newsletter or to contribute to the offer. If this is your first time with us, welcome. We're really happy that you've chosen to spend this Sunday morning here. Please plan to stay for coffee in the fellowship hall after the service, and we'll have a chance to get better acquainted. On Zoom, I fear you'll have to provide your own coffee. However, you can remain for a few minutes of fellowship and use that chat link that I mentioned so that we may keep in touch. And we hope to see you all again. We bid you welcome to this place. It is a space that we love and we tend with care. We don't ask that you believe what you believe, nor expect you to think the way we do. We only ask that you endeavor to live a kindly, helpful life with the dignity proper to a human being. Welcome to all who understand that religion is wider than any sect and deeper than any set of opinions. And welcome to all who would find in our fellowship strength and encouragement for daily living. Does anyone have any announcements of congregational concern? A mic for Mike. Thank you, Linda. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming today and thanks for forgiving our technical difficulties. We're doing a lot more technically than we ever have before. And uh, thanks to Pat and Lydia for their contribution this morning. It's great. Uh, there will be a concert in this room coming up on the 24th of September with uh, Deborah Vogel. And I do hope you'll Find one of us and buy a ticket. It's twenty bucks, and it's a it's a a benefit for us. So please come. Also on the twenty fifth, we will have the opening for the current art exhibit, which is Web Gormaco, and uh, it's a fantastic uh, fantastic show. So please come and see it. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Looks like Keith Jordan. Uh, Keith Jordan, I have uh, two announcements related to uh, musical themes. Uh, one is another concert, which is going to be on October 29th. And I'm sure John Kinney will be providing us with more information about that in the coming weeks, uh, which is going to be a UU songbook celebration concert. It will be featuring Pat Lamana and Lydia Adams Davis, and several other performers who will be performing songs that uh, have been written by songwriters from the Hudson Valley who are Unitarian Universal. And also, the folk will be coming back to the uh, UU here. And it will be starting on September 10th, Saturday, September 10th. And both of those events are seven thirty in the evening. Thank you, Steve. The chalice is the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. We'll transition now to our worship service by at home lighting our chalices, and I will light a chalice here as Lydia shares these words of Stephen B. Anthony. It was we, the people, not we, the white male citizen, nor yet we, the male citizens, but we, all people who formed the union. And we formed it, not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure them, not to have the okay. union and have our posterity. But to the whole people, women as well as men. So our opening song this morning is a slightly altered version of Hymn Number One Hundred Nine from our uh, 
Tim Book and Lydia and I are sharing the microphone, so I'm going to give it back to her so that she can hear me. No way to focus this thing.
your equality, women of America, the guarantee of your liberty. That vote of yours has cost millions of dollars and the lives of thousands of women. Women have suffered agony of soul, which you can never comprehend, that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly. Prize it. The vote is a power, a weapon of offense and defense, a prayer. Use it intelligently, conscientiously, prayerfully. Progress is calling to you to make no pause. Act. Carry Chad Cat. One of the ways we strengthen the bonds between us is by the sharing of joys and concerns. Please come to the side of the sanctuary to use the microphone. And on Zoom, there's a little hand icon at the bottom of the screen, or you can write your message in the chat box. Rose will call on you and or leave a message from the chat box. Both on the phone, you'll be unmuted so that you can speak. And please identify yourself. Our ritual is to place a stone into the sand. Any of the lawyers please share this? Yeah. I'm learning to use microphones. <laughs> Actually, I have a couple of things. One is um, concerned. I have a brother in law, we have a brother in law now. Reasons unknown. Two year old, great nephew in the hospital, asthma, and even the cat isn't feeling well. Just not a good weekend. So, you know, there's that. And to my wife, people living in no home living and the universe itself, finally opening up my mind to learning. And I'm sorry, it's choking me up. As a Jew, I vow never to set foot in Germany ever. Yeah. Ever. Oh, I'm Dave. So I thought everybody knows me. Everybody. Uh, I, I, as a Jew, I vow never to set foot in Germany ever. And through a number of machinations and the final machination, the universe called me out of the schmuck. And I was son now with President Berlin. So I cannot go to Germany. So on September 7th, I'm getting on the plane with my dog fight and go to Germany. It's taken me a long time, and I've learned a lot of things, and I'm learning more. And now, thanks to her, my life has improved. I'm sorry for choking up. It's a lot. So thank you for your time. Good morning, I'm Paul. It's a joy to be here today with these two really fine musicians. I've known one for quite some time, very, very talented people, and they're doing a wonderful program today. I'm very happy to be here and bring this flag. Uh, I was years ago driving to Pennsylvania with my brother. We stopped at a giant museum. This place was a mill. Where hundreds and hundreds of women worked on the animal slave like conditions uh, with male overseers under just unspeakable. And they turned this whole giant block of mills into a museum. And this is a suffragist flag that I bought at the gift shop there. I'm really happy to share it with her. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Bill. Uh, I have nothing but concern this morning. Um, starting with my wife, um, she felt uh, some people the uh, didactics, ironic, on the other day, announcing this during the, the, the service. Um, uh, she felt something with her right the, the breast, and she went for a mammogram. So uh, and the mammogram turned up, uh, you know, turned up a spot that was deemed suspicious. So she's going to start going through the and going through the steps of being treated with breast cancer. 
on uh, Thursday. She's going to go for biopsy, and then you know we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, how we're, we're very we're very happy uh, with the oncologist uh, that we met, Dr. Diamond in uh, Cornwall. And he was very encouraging, and you know I know uh, showed that might be showed that might be with hands, but you got to go through you know you have to go through the fight. Um, second, uh, my cousin, my cousin in uh, Portland, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to visit her. But she's having uh, she's having gallbladder surgery. And touch of a brighter note, uh, my 97 year old mom is just living. Again, a couple of weeks ago, she fell. And she was you know kind of out of it, uh, but she's actually improving. Um, she's actually improving. Uh, I guess that pro probably. Um, what's in the dose of gabapentin? So she's not as rocky and drowsy, and uh, and they're actually you know she's getting back to uh, you know walking with the walker and you know not not a big chair. So that's that's a little bit. Of it. Good morning. It's very good to be back with you. It's very good to be away. Trying to back from Scotland. Body was glad that I am. Everybody was just me about everything. Everything's me. Men, women, I'm going to start using them. We used to laugh. Kind of funny. I had the opportunity to see kayak in the Northern Islands. And it's unbelievably beautiful. Then I was back to Edinburgh and stayed with um, relatives of a very close friend. And it was a good thing they were good. Because I was delayed for two days because of weather in New York. So I managed to avert the rail strike to get to Inverness and back. I managed to fly out. I managed to avert all the other strikes everywhere. The refuse guys were striking. So there's, it, it was great, but I was two days stuck. So by that point, I was completely home. So I'm glad to be back. Thank you. And I have two stones of joys. Um, one, two, three, two, three, three. This week, we celebrated uh, my husband Fred. I mean, he's in New York, but I spoke to him before. Uh, it was his 91st birthday. And we celebrated with a very good time. Gary came yesterday at 10. So there's a stone for Gary Key. And one of the people who came from Pennsylvania is my grandson, Peter, who is, he's my grandson, Fred's son, the son of Fred's oldest son. So Peter, thanks for being here this morning. He actually was home with our family. I also have a concern of the people who was invited to come yesterday and sent regrets was Barbara Colton. And she said that she was, and I don't think is anymore, but may still be a patient at Garland Hospital in Middletown. She's okay. She said she would be out soon, but please hold Barbara and the boys in her hearts and thoughts. And we're thinking about the O'Neill's. Rose and Patrick. Yeah, Rose and Patrick will be here with us this morning, but I don't know if it's a public announcement or not, Mike, but they're not here with us today. <laughs> So that's in our hearts as we enter into two minutes of silence. Let the bell call you in this period of simple silence, prayer, or meditation, whatever may be your practice. The bell will call you back to this time and place.
Now, just over 102 years after the passage of legislation giving women of the United States of America the right to vote, let's enjoy a musical celebration of women's suffrage performed by Pat Lamont and Lydia Adams Davis and the world is joined by Richard Adams. We will have some time for questions and comments, so we can listen to everything. Looking for all the other final. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. Much of what we're about to read to you today is taken from the liner notes written by Irvin Silver from a 1958 folkways record, Songs of the Subterranean. Remember record? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> this is where we learned many of the songs. We've adapted and excerpted those liner notes. So, quote, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, unquote. To those few simple words, American women gave the right to vote. Today, wow. we are still fighting for the right of every woman to vote and have their vote counted. We would do well to remember shall the issue of women suffrage, rights the nation from coast to coast. Rights demonstrations, outraged sermons, indignant editorials, and frenzied emotional outbursts from all sides come in rain. Highlight the history of the long uphill fight for women's electoral rights, which was capped by time to the adoption of the 19th Amendment. One important step forward came from the emergence of the great anti slavery agitation of the 1830s. The natural ideological affinity of these two causes was heightened by the active and leading role played by many women in the abolitionist movement. I have a great grandmother who's active in WCTU, or maybe she's a great 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 grandmother using time here. Outside of male figures in the battle against slavery, like William Lloyd Garrison, outstanding Frederick Douglass, were also ardent champions of women's rights. Another famous abolitionist and suffragist was Sojourner Truth. As I'm sure you know, Sojourner Truth was born into slavery in Ulster County. Yeah. She escaped in 1826, although she knew that slavery was going to be abolished in New York State in 1827. She traveled around the country giving speeches and singing songs about abolition and women's rights. Here is one of the songs attributed to her. Like many protest songs of that day and this, it was written to a familiar tune. Mm -hmm. I am pleading for my people to have their rights restored, for they have long been toiling and yet have no reward. They are forced the crop to culture, yet not for them they yield, although but late and early. They labor in the field while I bear upon my body the scars of many a gash. I'm pleading for my people who grow beneath the lash. I'm pleading for the mothers who gaze in wild. auction block and see their children there. But while your kindest sympathies to foreign lands do roam, I'd ask you to remember your own oppressed at home. I plead with you to sympathize with sighs and groans and scars, and note how base the tyranny beneath the stripes 
In 1840, the Christian Mark and Luke the Kings and the work on the American delegates in the first world and by a slavery convention in London. These women lost in the assembly, and the convention refused to seat them as delegates. Undaunted, the entire American delegation refused to take part and took seats in the gallery for the remainder of the proceedings. Stirred and agitated by their experiences in London, Mott and Sandman resolved that upon returning home, they would initiate a campaign for women's rights on a wider scale than ever before. In 1848, they called the first American Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. By 1852, women's rights groups in many parts of the country were holding conventions. Despite this, the monumental struggle against slavery eclipsed women's rights, the rights of the women's rights movement until after the Civil War. Although there were dissenters, most of the suffragists were abolitionists themselves and understood the necessity of winning the anti slavery battle first. Mm -hmm. It is significant that the first suffrage song for which we have any record did not appear until after 1865. For example, here's a popular one from 1884. Can you all see and hear us well? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks for your attention. Absolutely. Hi, Zoom. Yes, I hope I'm doing the camera thanks.
People's History, Voices of a People's History, edited by Howard Zinn and Anthony um, Arnold. In November 1872, Susan B. Anthony was one of the 14 women who defied the law to cast a ballot in the presidential election. Anthony was arrested for knowingly voting without having the lawful right to vote. And on June 18th, 1873, was found guilty. The next day, when her lawyer appealed the verdict, she addressed the courts in response to the question from the judge, Lord Hunt. And now, Richard Maddox and Pat Lamana will now reenact that dramatic scene with some redactions for time consideration. Has the prisoner anything to say? Why seven shall not be pronounced? Yes, Your Honor. I have many things to say. For in your ordered verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of our government. My natural rights, my civil rights, my political rights, my judicial rights are all alike ignored. Robbed of the fundamental privilege of citizenship, I am degraded from the status of a citizen to that of a subject. And not only myself individually, but all of my sex, by your honor verdict, due to political subjection under this so called Republican form of the court cannot listen to a reversal of arguments that the prisoner's counsel has already consumed. Three hours in presenting. May it please your honor, I am not arguing the question, but simply stating the reasons why sentence cannot in justice be pronounced against me. Your denial of my citizens' right to vote is the denial of my right to consent as one of the government, the denial of my right of representation as one of the acts, the denial of my right to a trial by a jury of my peers as defended against law, therefore the denial of my sacred right to life Liberty, property. The prisoner in court cannot allow the prisoner. But your honor will not deny me this one and only poor privilege of protest against this high-handed outrage upon my citizens' rights. May it please the court to remember that since the day of my arrest last November, this is the first time that either myself or any person of my disfranchised class has been allowed a word of defense before judge or jury. Prisoner must sit down. The court cannot allow this to forward. All my prosecutors, from the East Ward corner grocery politician who entered the court, to the United States Marshal, Commissioner, District Attorney, District Judge, your honorable bench, not one of my peers, but each and all of my political scholars, and had your honor submitted my case to the jury, as was clearly the duty, even then I should have had just called the protest. For not one of those men was my peer, but native or foreign, white or black, rich or poor, educated or ignorant, awake or asleep, sober or drunk, each and every man of them was my political superior, hence in no sense is my peer. Even my counsel who had argued my case so ably, so earnestly, so unanswerably before your honor is my political sovereign. The court must insist the prisoner has been tried according to the established forms of law. Yes, Your Honor, but by the forms of law, all made by men, interpreted by men, administered by men, in favor of men, and against women. And hence, Your Honor's ordered verdict of guilty against the United States citizen for the exercise of that citizen's right to vote, simply because that citizen was a woman and not a man. But a few short years ago, the same man-made forms of law declared it a crime to give a cup of cold water, a crust of bread, or a night's shelter to a panting fugitive who was tracking his way to Canada. And every man or woman in whose veins forced a drop of human sympathy violated that wicked law, reckless of consequences, and was justified in doing so. As then, the slaves who got their freedom must take it over or under or through the unjust forms of law. 
Precisely so, now must women to get their right to a voice in this government take it, and I have taken mine, and mean to take it at every possible opportunity. As Susan B. Anthony points out, if women would be forced to pay taxes and obey laws, then they certainly are entitled to have some say in electing the public officials who decided to tax, impose that tax and pass those laws. This song is called The Taxation of the Tyranny. <clears throat> no, it's not about the IRS. <laughs> <laughs>
When a suffragist gathered in the Seventh Fall in Oregon, July 1848, the persistent participants were middle and upper class white women who struggled a week to claim the suffrage, and one African American male, Frederick Douglass. No black women attended the convention, none were invited. The American Equal Rights Association, founded by Elizabeth Cady Tenney, Susan B. Anthony, and Frederick Douglass in 1866, disclosed three years later over the woman's refusal to support the 15th Amendment, which gave blacks men the right to vote. The issue divided the woman's suffrage movement for two decades. One faction, including Stanton and Anthony, supported agitating for passage of another institution, giving women the vote. The other group, which included Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Lucy Stone, were to get the franchise for women incrementally, state by state. Stanton, Anthony, and others used most unfortunate language to argue their cause. One of the most odious quotes I came upon was uttered by Elizabeth K. Stanton in a speech opposing the 15th Amendment. Using stereotypical slurs against immigrants and formerly enslaved men, she proclaimed, Think of Patrick and Sambo and Hans and Young Paul, who do not know the difference between a monarchy and a republic. Who cannot read the Declaration of Independence or Webster's Spelling Law, making laws for Lydia Marie Child, Lucretia Mott, or Fanny Kemble? This amendment creates antagonism everywhere between educated, refined women and the lower orders of men, especially in the South. Susan B. Anthony, alluding to the 15th Amendment, stated, I will cut off this right arm of mine before I will ever work for or demand the ballot of the Negro and not the woman. In 1890, two groups merged once again, and the new organization was dominated by middle and upper class white women. When a large suffragist demonstration was planned on the day after Woodrow Wilson's inauguration in 1913, the organizers told the black suffragists they could join the march, but had to go to the back. Mary Church Terrell, one of the founders of the NAACP, complied. Ida B. Wells, a well-known journalist, marched with the Chicago delegation from which she had come. I was unable to find a song which addresses this less than savory aspect of the women's suffrage movement, so I decided to write one. Like other songs of the movement, I wrote it to a familiar tune. <clears throat> I call it the other side of women's suffrage. Let us sing in the praise of suffragists, their courage and their grace. How they fought to win the right to vote for women of their race. Lucretia and Elizabeth and Susan and Anthony fought for women's right to vote for white supremacy. 
So I think that's part of it. You know, she was just mad. Rather cut off my right hand. And you know, the problem is that by giving black men the vote, it would delay, delay, delay black women the vote. That's not a racist situation. It was not racist at all because I would go on to remind you all that Susan B. Anthony was from New York State, as was Sojourner Truth. And they actually were friends. And so Journey Truth came on her long travels and found wonderful, wonderful lodgings with Susan B. Anthony, even slept in the same bed with her. And she helped Susan B. Anthony in many, many ways that are easily found out with a little reading and a little plain common sense. So I defend my beautiful hero. And we all get mad sometimes, don't we? And what we say gets taken weirdly out of consequence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. again from the American Civil Liberties Union website. The history of women's suffrage in America is not nice for me because the impact of white supremacy is broad and human nature is messy. We must constantly acknowledge this truth and engage in an intersectional celebration of women's rights activists and landmark events. So let us acknowledge that the 19th Amendment marks a partial but significant victory and sing our closing song in celebration and hope as the struggle continues. Please join in when we sing hurrah. <laughs> oh, and it starts out well, there's a little verse about them. So when they mention the banner, you can see that very authentic banner. Right there. <laughs> 